the mind goes through all sorts of bizarre places about pain and collapse and escape and wanting to eject and all of these habitual patterns that we develop over time. And what I found is it took every ounce of mental fortitude and I had to go so deep and go so much, uh, so far mm. beyond my uh, comfort and my habits of wanting to like eject. I walked out of there having the same feeling of finishing my first marathon, essentially. Like, I fucking did that. Holy shit, I cannot believe I held my arms up for 62 minutes. <laughs> so maybe you can help us understand what is happening. This is the white tantra practice of Kundalini oh Yoga, right? Like 12, 14 hours of this where you go 31 minutes for some, 62 for another. Like, what's happening in this practice? So white tantra... First of all, I miss it. I'm, I'm so happy you brought that up. No, number one, I can't believe that's your first introduction to Kundalini. Oh, oh, just to be clear, it wasn't my first introduction to Kundalini, <laughs> okay. but it was my first. Say, that is so crazy. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I'd been practicing for a few years and, and okay. um, someone invited. I just didn't know what I was getting myself into, I think was no, the point. It's, it's such a great practice. Um, you know, what's happening in general when we do any Kriya, even if it's white Tantra or just a normal, normal class, what's happening is the Kriyas are imprinting in you a mm -hmm. memory. I always tell people it's like a, a microchip. It's like every time you do your practice, whether you do it once a month or every day, every time you do it, you're imprinting a new memory into your whole entire system. And what's happening is when we get confronted, the Kriya confronts us and the Kriya and the meditations are there to show you yourself. So you get to see how you trip up in your life. You get to see where you want to run and what triggers you. And that's what the Kriyas are doing. And that's what white tantric is doing on a whole nother level. And then on top of it, you know, the idea that you're working with a partner and you're looking into each other's eyes. You know what's interesting about White Tantra? Your partner is not really the energetics that you're working with. It's the people that are in the diagonal line across oh, from you. So Those true. are the energetics that are really working with you. It's such a profound practice. Um, the other aspect is that it is clearing so much so fast. Now, okay. The mystical side, you know, without sounding too woo woo. Um, Bring out the woo. We, we do the woo here. So, okay. Well, what I want to say is I feel like anyone who finds themselves in those rooms are really like people who have worked lifetimes to get there. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, and I feel that way so strongly. It's like whether. It's the first time they're in that room or the third or the 10th or the hundredth that took so many lifetimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's that compounded with like, it's, it certainly felt like a lot of lifetimes on about mif minute 55. I think <laughs> <laughs> I think I, di I had died about, uh, you know, 10 times in those, in the 62 minutes. So <laughs> whenever I'm in those practices, I always like, I always feel like it's, it could be my imagination though, because I have a yeah. very wild imagination. Um, but I can always feel like, wow, like we've all been here before. We've all mm. been doing this so yeah. many lifetimes. We've been doing this. So when we go into deeply into these practices, there is this kind of like eternal quality to time. It just, it just doesn't, it just drops away. Right. And we, we can feel kind of in all directions when we're in these uh, states of deep practice and insight. And, and um, that's certainly one of the beautiful benefits and so much wonderment and awe and kind of appreciation emerge from those, from those places of deep practice. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm so curious for you, like, how did you, like, I'd love to just hear a bit of your own personal story. Like, how did you find these practices? You know, you strike me as someone who, you know, having known you for a bit now, like you're not like Kundalini yoga is the like, is the focus it's how, it's your platform it's how you teach but you're you you strike me as someone who's done a lot more work outside of just kundalini yoga to be able to 
you know, teach from such a powerful place. So I'm just curious a bit about your story. Like, how did you find your way into these practices and anything else that's kind of informed your journey? Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Just because um, I feel like Kundalini has such a big identity, like Kundalini yoga has such a big identity. And I noticed that like those of us who teach it, it really becomes our identity. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, and so for me, um, there's been times in my practice and in my life where like, it really was all that I did, (laughs) you know what I mean? All that I could breathe. And over the years I've come full circle within myself and it feels so good right now in my life to be able to hold the space in that way that I do of where it is definitely you know, what I live, drink and breathe, but I feel like I have an identity now. It's like, it's Mm -hmm. not, it's not, I'm not wearing it. It's not wearing me. Spirituality has always been a part of me. Like I've always been aware um, of my spiritual seekingness. Like I've always been, I used to always say, I've always been a seeker since I was a child. And I grew up in a very kind of Christian in a loose Christian household, I will say. I go to church with my great grandmother on Sundays. And because I would watch her pray, I would learn how to pray through watching her, you know, that kind of thing. But even as a child, as a really young child, I felt very unfulfilled. I didn't grow up with my dad. I I mean, my parents split up when I was really young. So I would visit my dad on like once a month or once a season, I'd get to go stay with my dad. My dad had a totally different world that he exposed me to, which was much more aligned with who I am today in the sense Mm. of my dad was very spiritual. My dad was an avid faster. My Mm. dad was totally into like Native American practices. Mm. My father always made sure that he wanted me to know that I'm Native American. He gave Mm. me my first Native American Bible. He always told me, if you want to pray, you should just, if you want to go to church, sit with a tree. That's how he taught me. My father was a conspiracy theory person. He would trap me in the car at like five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Like he would not let me leave the car. He'd be like, no, I need you to listen to this. (laughs) He would be be playing some crazy, like secret tape of something (laughs) that... I don't even know where he'd get these tapes from, but like, it would be some kind of UFO sighting stuff from that to like what they're going to be doing to the future, to us in the future and how we're going to have, we're going to have a digit on our wrists. And this is how we're going to be paying for our groceries. And you need to stay away from credit. Like (laughs) my father was like from five until, and I remember finally at like, you know, first of all, I always thought my father was that shit crazy. I was just like, <laughs> he's crazy. <laughs> you know what I mean? I would just, I, not with the spiritual stuff, not with like the, what he was giving me as far as the Native American stuff, but was like the, the secret tapes that he had make me sit in the car and listen to. That's when I was like, okay, he's crazy. But I would humor him and I would, I would just like kind of like let him hold me hostage and I would go along with the flow. But I remember one day, finally at like age, probably 13 or 12 or something like that. I remember saying to my dad, dad, this is so depressing. Mm. Like, it's just so heavy. Like what, like, I, I, I almost felt like it's too much. I can't take it anymore. Like, it's just too much. And you know what he said to me? I said, I think I said something like, what are we going to do? And he said, you have to develop your spirit. He was like, you have to develop your spirit. He said, because if you develop yourself spiritually, they will not be able to touch you. That's how you will stay free. And that was gold for me. Like that was it. Like when he said that, that became the most important thing in my life. She gave me an aspect of that where my dad gave me more the structural aspect of just the curiosity of being a seeker definitely was implanted by my father. And that, that, that other, meaning that ability to travel a road that others don't travel, that definitely was planted by my father. 
And it is a part of who he is and how he walks in the world. And I don't want to make my father sound like, you know, a guru because, but he was my guru and he still is my guru. And meanwhile, my father has dealt with like drug addiction. He's dealt with all kinds of crazy stuff, but like, even still my father could still drop in and like, give like the best wisdom, like the best, like (laughs) all my life, I've always been like, you should, I, you need to write a book. You should be known. And he'd always say, no, you just write your own book and you could talk about it in in your book. I don't want anyone to write a book. I don't want to write a book. But Hmm. yeah, yeah. My dad, I would say was my first guru. Oh, so it's so beautiful. Such a beautiful kind of um, love note to your father and the ways that he inspired you. 